Hello again everyone and welcome to part 2 of our coverage on the murders at White House Farm that took place on 7 August 1985 in Essex, England. I suggest perhaps watching part 1 first so you have more of a backstory on the events that happened but I will give you a quick recap on the case. Sheila Cathal and her twin sons were set to visit her parents June and Neville Bamber on their farm for one week. On the night of 6 August 1985, her brother Jeremy, who was not living on the farm, had dinner with them and soon left. He stated that they had been woken by a distressed call from his father on the morning of 7 August around 3 a.m., with his father telling him that Sheila had gone berserk with a gun. When Jeremy and the police arrived at the farm and the police entered the house, they found all five family members shot dead inside the house. Sheila was lying next to the bed in the main bedroom with a rifle on her body. Sheila had been diagnosed with schizophrenia and had been receiving treatment after being hospitalized. The police fairly quickly came to the conclusion that Sheila had been the one that committed the murders and then took her own life afterwards. Due to this, several pieces of evidence was either destroyed, not collected at all, or only taken into account more than a month after the murders. With family and some police suspicious and a damning statement from Jeremy's ex-girlfriend, as well as a silencer that was found in the house, led to everyone believing that it could not have possibly been Sheila that committed the crimes. Jeremy was charged and convicted with the murders of his family. He was sentenced to a full life term without the possibility of parole. This video will take a look at what Jeremy and his team have stated and put out after his conviction. A campaign to free Jeremy had started pretty soon after he was convicted and several arguments were made on this campaign maintaining that Jeremy was wrongfully convicted and that evidence had needed to be reviewed as there were several things that this campaign felt had not tied up correctly. This was all evidence that was allegedly not brought forth in the original trial or looked into further according to Jeremy's team. Jeremy's team to this day state that there are police logs that were recorded that show that the police had been in conversation with someone inside the house whilst Jeremy was waiting outside with them. The police said that no one had answered their loud hailer calls however. One of the officers thought that he also saw movement inside the bedroom window when they had first arrived when Jeremy was outside with them. The police later said that it might have just been a reflection. This is what allegedly also led to the call out of the firearms team. Officers testified to having heard noises upstairs when they entered the house upon moving through the house. But you need to remember that there are three staircases in this house. So it could have been other police officers moving up the other staircases. It was stated that Sheila would not have been able to overpower Neville a point was made during the trial that Neville had been shot in the bedroom before he had gone down the stairs to the kitchen and that he had been severely injured from these shots, which might have weakened him and enabled Sheila to fight him. Also, no consideration was taken into account on whether Neville had been beaten after he had died, Jeremy's team stated. Jeremy's team also indicate that several testimonies have been made about women being in psychotic states and being able to overpower many people larger than them. Jeremy's team has also since disputed the location of Sheila's body. Sheila was found upstairs with her mother on the floor of the main bedroom on her father's side of the bed. But early police logs reported a police officer looking through a window and seeing what he thought was the body of a woman near the kitchen door, but he later radioed that it was a man. There were logs that stated two bodies of one man and one woman were found downstairs upon the police entries to the house, and that the police surgeon was to be informed. The search then continued further in the house. Another log later came stating a further three bodies were found upstairs. 
Jeremy's team argue that Sheila shot herself downstairs, but that it was not fatal, and that as the police moved upstairs to search the rest of the house, she used one of the three staircases that they were not using to go upstairs and fatally shot herself in the bedroom whilst the house was being searched. They also say the fact that people think that Sheila would just sit up and let Jeremy put a rifle under her chin and shoot her once and not kill her. Then, she did not fight with him as he repositioned the rifle and shot her again is ludicrous. If she was of clear mind like everyone had stated, would she not have fought, according to them? They said that it, there was no indication that Sheila was drugged, so it was also not a possibility that she was drugged and not aware of what was happening. Jeremy's team also argue that images of Sheila taken by a police photographer around 9 a.m. on 7 August 1985 showed that her blood was still wet and running from her wounds. According to the defense team, had she been killed before 3.30 a.m. as indicated, the blood would have congealed by 9 a.m. when the photographs were taken. They argued that she was alive when Jeremy and the police were standing outside, that she must have shot herself in the kitchen just as the police entered, then ran up one of the staircases to the bedroom where she shot herself again, this time fatally. Giovanni Di Stefano says vital evidence was withheld from Bamba's original defense team. This includes a photo of Sheila taken at 9 a.m. on the morning of the crime. By 9 a.m., Bamba had already been in police custody for five hours. The close-up of blood flowing and pouring photograph being taken, taking us to 6.30, uh, 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 seven, you know, 7 o'clock, maybe 5, maybe at its worst, but definitely not more. So it could not, Bamba could not have murdered uh, her. It's impossible. In photos taken after Sheila's death, she is seen with socks next to her body, indicating that she might have worn the socks and taken them off before shooting herself. Jeremy's team also indicated that there were blood spots on said socks, and the socks were much lighter than was shown in the photos. They also state that her left sole of her foot had blood on it, indicating that she had stepped in blood at some point. It is also stated that her nails were painted red and were chipped badly in certain places and not perfectly manicured as indicated. Jeremy's team also argue that the first officers to enter the farmhouse had disturbed the crime scene severely and then they reconstructed it. Crime scene photographs not made available to the original defense show Sheila's right arm and hand in slightly different positions in relation to the gun which is lying across her body. The gun itself also moved and was photographed elsewhere at another time and placed back on Sheila's body later to take more photos. Photos show a Bible was found next to Sheila's body and like the gun, different photos show it has been moved during the scene of crime work. In one picture, it shows a handwritten note sticking out of the Bible, but it is not mentioned in the police logs, however. They feel that it might be plausible that this might have been a suicide note from Sheila, but not examined, and no examination of this note was ever done or recorded. Bamba's legal team also say they've found a photo of what might be a suicide note in a Bible next to Sheila's body. In the Bible, there is a letter. Now that could be a suicide letter. That was never disclosed. After the trial, that Bible was destroyed by the police. Heaven knows why. Bamba and his lawyers have sought since 1987 to demolish the silencer evidence. They stated the fact that it was found by one of the cousins who inherited part of the estate mere days after the police had searched the house in the exact cupboard where they had looked, blighted the prosecution's case. 
although it was accepted by a majority of the jury. It is said that evidence became confused because of the way the exhibit was named. It was renamed three different times and these name changes led to confusion in later documents, giving the impression that more than one silencer had been found. According to the Times in 2013, and as well as the Jeremy Barber campaign, he aimed to show that the police had taken more than one silencer from his family members, including the one in the gun cupboard on the very day of the murders, and that evidence and paperwork from them, and from an additional laboratory silencer, had been mixed up. In or around 2012, Jeremy's lawyers commissioned gun experts from the US and the UK to examine photographs of the bodies and the silencer evidence. They argued that injuries on the bodies were consistent with the silencer not having been used, and that its absence would explain burn marks on Neville's body. The court had heard that three circular burn mark type wounds on Neville's back had been found. In November 1985, a police report had argued that the burn marks were made with the hot end of the gun or with a poker. Jeremy's lawyers argue that the burn marks on his back were more than likely caused by the silencer not being used and the gun being pushed towards his back and him being forced down the stairs, which would have caused the circular burn marks on his back. Jeremy's team commissioned a report from a forensic photographic expert to examine negatives of the kitchen taken on the day of the murders and later. He argued that the scratch marks in the red paintwork on the kitchen piece mantle had been created after the crime scene photographs had been taken. The prosecution during Jeremy's trial alleged that the marks had been made during the struggle in the kitchen between Jeremy and his father, as the silencer attached to the rifle had scratched against the mantelpiece. They then had the paint chips found in and on the silencer tested and it came back as identical to the paint on the mantelpiece. The expert that Jeremy's team hired, however, said that the scratch marks appeared in photographs taken on 10 September 1985, 34 days after the murders, but were not visible in the original crime scene photographs. He also said he had failed to find any chip paint on the carpet below the mantelpiece in the photographs that have been given to evaluate, and that you might have expected the paint chips to fall on the carpet had the mantelpiece been scratched during the struggle. He was also asked to examine a red spot on the carpet visible in photographs underneath the scratches on the mantelpiece. He said the red spot matched a piece of nail varnish missing from one of Sheila's toes. He concluded that the scratch marks on the mantel had been created after the day of the murder. Pictures on the day of the murder, August the 7th, show no scratch marks on the mantel shelf. The court had believed that these um, scratch marks underneath the mantel shelf had taken place during the incident itself. That was something which the uh, jury and the prosecution relied upon in order to convict Mr. Bamba of the um, crime. It was possible to line up all these um, pictures in jigsaw fashion uh, to show that the um, scratch mark uh, from the underside of the mantel shelf did not extend into the uh, picture of the mantel shelf taken on the uh, 7th of August, the time of the incident itself. So the marks had been put there after the original incident. Peter Southers to find a second piece of evidence that also convinced him that the scratch mark evidence was unsigned. I was looking for traces of paint particles uh, which would have dropped from the mantel shelf onto the um, carpet below the mantel shelf directly in front of the hour cooker. Uh, I, I looked very carefully at the uh, carpet and there was no evidence whatsoever of any paint particles or any wood particles or anything like that there. Uh, I, when I would have expected them to be there if the marks had occurred on the 7th of August. In this case, the scratch marks underneath the mantel shelf turned out to be the most significant um, bit of evidence that we came across. The scratch marks, which were central plank to the prosecution's assertions, those scratch marks, um, it now appears, were not in fact made on the night of the murders 
and were in fact made at some point afterwards. For that reason, the significance of Mr. Souther's findings really cannot be overestimated. Police telephone logs had been entered as evidence during the trial, but had not been noticed by Jeremy's original defence lawyers. His new team based their new submission in part on these logs, particularly on the radio log from Essex Police. They say, show Neville called the police that night to say his daughter had gone berserk with one of his guns. This call clearly talks about a father referring to a daughter. They state that this was a separate call logged from the one that was made by Jeremy to Chelmsford that stated that his father had phoned him to say that his sister had gone berserk with a gun. The police said that the officer simply made a mistake and that this was only one call and the second officer noted it down incorrectly as the message was relayed to him to call for a car to go to the farm and that these were merely duplicates of the same call. Jeremy's lawyers also argue that a letter written to Julie Magford on 26 September 1985 from the Assistant Director of Public Prosecutions raised the possibility that she had been persuaded to testify in hope that charges against her in the burglary at the caravan park and the green herb that they had brought from Amsterdam would not be pursued. The defense team also highlighted that as soon as the verdict was announced, Julie had sold her story to News of the World for £25,000, but she would only be paid if Jeremy had been convicted, which makes her testimony all the more suspect, according to his team. Jeremy first sought leave to appeal in November 1986, arguing that the judge had misdirected the jury during his final statement. During a full hearing in March 1989, before three appeal court judges, Jeremy's lawyer argued that the trial judge's summing up had been biased against Jeremy, that his language had been too forceful, and that he had undermined the defense by advancing his own theory. He also argued that the defense had not pressed Julie about her dealings with the media because as soon as the trial was over, her story began appearing in newspapers. On 20 March 1989, these judges refused Jeremy's leave to appeal, ruling that there was nothing unsafe or unsatisfactory about the verdicts. His second application for leave to appeal in 1994 was also denied. In 1996, a police officer destroyed many of the trial exhibits, saying later that he had not been aware that the case was still ongoing. Jeremy's defense team referred to the destruction of the blood samples and other evidence as a disgrace. In 1997, the Home Office passed Jeremy's case to the Criminal Cases Review Commission, which review alleged miscarriages of justice. In March 2001, the CCRC referred the case to the Court of Appeal because of the discovery of DNA inside the silencer. This was found as a result of a test that was not available in 1986 and constituted fresh evidence upon which he could receive a re answer that Sheila's DNA might have been in the silencer and that there was evidence of DNA from at least one male in the silencer. The judge's conclusion was that the results were complex, incomplete and also meaningless because they did not establish how June's DNA came to be in the silencer years after the trial, did not establish that Sheila's was not in it and did not lead to a conclusion that Jeremy's conviction was unsafe. A conclusion was made on 12 December 2002 that there was no conduct on the part of the investigators that threatened the integrity of the trial, and that the more they examined the case and the evidence, In 2004, Jeremy's defense team again applied unsuccessfully to have the CCRC refer the case back to the Court of Appeals. His lawyers made a fresh admission to the CCRC again in 2009. The application was again rejected in April 2012 
stating that the submission had not identified any new evidence or legal argument that would raise the real possibility of the Court of Appeals overturning Jeremy's conviction. In November 2012, the High Court turned down Jeremy's application for a judicial review of that decision. It is also reported that Jeremy had allegedly passed a polygraph test that was done in 2007. To Jeremy's supporters, who over the years have included members of parliament and journalists and many of the public, he is a victim of one of Britain's worst miscarriages of justice. Jeremy's detractors, including his extended family, several members of the public and his father's former secretary, to this day believe that there is no doubt that Jeremy had been the one to kill his family. As of 2022, Jeremy Bamber is aged 61, the same age that Neville and June were when they were killed. Jeremy's team had lodged eight submissions with the CCRC on 10 March 2021. Jeremy has indicated that he will not stop fighting for his freedom. I would love to hear your opinion on this case. What are your thoughts? What are your theories? What do you think is the true story behind what happened at White House Farm? Is Jeremy guilty? Is he innocent? Was he wrongly convicted? Or was he in fact the cold-blooded killer of his family? Please leave me your notes in the comment section down below. I would love to hear your thoughts. I have left several links in the description box if you'd like to read more about this case. There's so much information out there if you'd like to know more. And once again, I would just like to say thank you so much for taking time out of your day and watching this video. I appreciate you so much. Please don't forget to leave me a like and subscribe if you're not yet subscribed. I would really appreciate that. It's a free way that you can help me out. Thank you so much and until next time, bye!